Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs event, we present New York Times Chief White House Correspondent Peter Baker and New Yorker staff writer Susan Glasser for their brand new book, The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. A first-term White House Chief of Staff faces three great tasks. Avoid scandal, get the president re-elected, and leave without getting fired. It is remarkable how few chiefs of staff over the past several decades have accomplished all three. But James Baker managed to do so, guiding Ronald Reagan's White House in the early 1980s and going on to powerful cabinet positions under Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush. In today's virtual conversation, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser discuss James Baker's life, a delegate hunter, campaign manager, White House Chief of Staff, Treasury Secretary, and Secretary of State, a man who played a leading role in some of the most critical junctures in modern American history. He was Washington's indispensable man. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with Peter Baker and Susan Glasser and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director John Highbush. Peter and Susan, it is just a delight to have you uh, here with us at the Reagan Library, socially distanced, obviously, a few thousand miles away. And I, I just want to congratulate you for what, what a fantastic book. I, 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 I think it's already hit the bestsellers list. Is that right? Yeah, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Exactly. We're very oh, yeah. happy. Yeah, well, congratulations. I, I took a special interest in this book uh, uh, because my own background, I worked on Capitol Hill the entire Reagan presidency and then went to work for President Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. And uh, so every page for me was reliving uh, an important uh, moment in my life. So uh, thank you for, for being so thorough and, and, and in my view, accurate, um, having lived through some of those times. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll start by asking you, the two of you are pros. You've been writing for first-rate publications your whole lives. And uh, you probably have the opportunity to pick and choose um, any historical, modern day historical figure that you'd like to write about. You chose James Baker, and I just wonder why James Baker? Well, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be with you today. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good question, but first of all, it's extraordinary that there had been no major biography of such a significant figure uh, to have been written. And so I think Peter and I were very excited uh, when we realized that because Baker, uh, as, as the book now attests, uh, you know, really gets you into the middle of the story of Washington, you know, really from the end of Watergate to the end of the Cold War. He essentially, uh, because he uniquely combined uh, a background and a portfolio in five different presidential campaigns, but also Secretary of the Treasury, White House Chief of Staff for two presidents, that's never been done before since, and of course, Secretary of State at the end of the Cold War. That combination of policy and politics, I think, is what makes Baker so unique. And we saw the opportunity not only to tell a fascinating American story of a, of a person, uh, but also the story of Washington at a place in time that now feel pretty definitively vanished when you look at uh, it in comparison with today. I was really struck, in fact, when we were thinking about whether to do this, I was in a cab in Cleveland, and the cab driver and I were talking about how broken things seem to be in Washington. And the cab driver says, if only we had a Jim Baker today. 
And there's <laughs> one like cab driver in Cleveland would say that, that he would think of Baker as the epitome of a moment when Washington worked. And I said, well, that's a, that's a reason to write a book then. Yeah, well, as you two know, cab cab drivers seem to always say the most prescient things. So, <laughs> well, absolutely it's right. Tom Friedman's cab drivers. That's true. <laughs> They're particularly <laughs> articulate. Sure, sure. Uh, now, having watched uh, Secretary Baker, Chief Staff Baker, from afar on the Hill for for years, um, I always. Uh, you touch in your book on the Baker, Meese, Deaver. Watching them in the newspapers or on television, what have you, at the time, of course, you knew Jim Baker as chief of staff had enormous importance. But as you two know, you didn't hear from him that often. He was the behind the scenes player. And, you know, you might see Meese or Deva or others more out in front. And so when I heard that this book was coming out, I was a little surprised. I thought, wow, Jim Baker, you know, sat for out hunt, you know, dozens of hours and, and wanted you, I guess, to, to write this biography. And uh, was it surprising to you that you sat with him and said, here's our idea, are you in? Because you'd think he might be reluctant. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the truth is, is that Baker is a very canny operator, uh, as I think the book portrays. Uh, and one of the things he clearly understood well into his 80s, uh, he just turned 90 this year, is that if you really want to be regarded as a you know real lasting figure in history, you can't just write your own memoirs. You have to have an independent work about you done. And he has written two of his own memoirs. So he's had his say. He's had a chance uh, to tell the, his story as he wanted it to be told. And you know, he was remarkably cooperative, not only in uh you know, spending, as you said, dozens of hours with us. Uh, but, you know, he, he allowed his eight children to cooperate. Uh, you know, we spoke with his 106-year-old nanny. Uh, perhaps most significantly, he gave us full access to his papers at Princeton University and at Rice University, uh, which was essentially founded by his grandfather. Uh, and, you know, that added a layer uh, and depth, I think, to the research that we were able to do. And of course, since Peter and I are working in Washington today, uh, where we don't have such access uh, to our subjects. It was a welcome diversion in that sense to really be able to dig deep into the texture of a life and to be able to look at, you know, and to produce memoirs, uh, sorry, memos and, and details that from the Reagan era that have not yet been made public. And I think, by the way, he made a deal with us early on to basically be open and to That's not right. try to steer us or tell us what to do. It's not an authorized book. This is our book, not his. He didn't see it before we turned it in or anything like that. But he lived up to his deal. For seven years, he worked on this, and he never tried to put anything off. He never tried to put anything off bounds. He didn't argue with us about any conclusions that we had. He didn't tell us that we were off base. And he shared, I think, parts of his life that he hadn't shared in public before, including his, his you know, early life with his, his first wife who dies and the struggles that his family had. They were open on every question we asked. In particular, actually, on this personal life, I, I didn't really expect that. And, and so that was one surprise of the project. Yeah, I, um, and that's what made the book as great as it is. You know, this was no puff piece. You know, this was uh, really the, just the facts and a lot of great stories. So I think it's what helps make the book sing. So it's great you were able to cut a deal like that. Um, now, I knew very little about his childhood, his growing up, his, you know, before he arrives in Washington. And I have to say, the thing that struck me, I'm not really sure why, was just the hugely important role his father played in his life. Uh, you know, the warden, as, you, as he was known. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little, because he was uh, part of his life uh, in every way, including financially, you know, being of help right into his 30s. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. And I found that to be one of the most uh, kind of illustrative parts of the story, too. And of course, you know, I don't know about you. I love biographies. I love to read them. I'm always someone who likes the first part of biographies more than the second part. Uh, yeah. you know, what what uh, someone's childhood and growing up in background is, um, you know, when you read a big book like this, right, you, you already know something of uh, the dazzling public resume or you probably wouldn't be picking it up. Uh, and uh, yet I knew nothing really about Jim Baker's background. So a couple big kind of takeaways and surprises even for us, first of all, just how accidental 
Baker's career in public life was, uh, and that actually, uh, rather than seeing it as a logical extension of his life, it really was almost um, a combination of an accident and a rebellion. And, uh, you know, his family was this very distinguished family in Houston. I mean, he was the son, grandson, and great-grandson of uh, very successful lawyers who essentially were more than lawyers. They were really builders of the modern city of Houston, institution builders. Uh, he had a very, very strict sense of uh, uh, family duty and obligation. It was a very constrained world in many ways uh, of privilege that he was born into. And in particular, as you mentioned, his father was this almost overbearing micromanaging figure called the warden. Uh, you know, and not, you know, if, you're, if your son nicknames you the warden, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a, a bar compliment to say the And, you know, you mentioned these memos we found in the, in the files in Princeton. I really struck me. These notes from his father, you know, well into his 30s, he's a grown man, he's married with children, and uh, he's working at a different law firm. And yet his dad can fold the family money. They, you know, not oil gazillionaires, uh, but, you know, certainly very well off. He's sending him like $25 checks to buy a suit from Books Brothers and even for his wife's Christmas present. Uh, and that level of control, it extended to uh, Baker after he graduated from college, went to the same college that his father uh, went to, Princeton, uh, goes to the Marines. Uh, this is in the, the Korean War era, although he served in the Mediterranean, he wants to go to law school. He's married with a young child at this point in time. His father insists he go to the University of Texas law school, not somewhere like Harvard. Uh, he agrees. Then when he gets there, he says, you have to pledge the same fraternity that I did. And he says, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm in a law school. I don't, you know, these are undergraduates. And he does it. And he has yeah. freshmen hazing him. Um, yeah, at age 24 father, or something. That's right, that's right, because his father told him to, and he made it clear to us that he didn't like that very much. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I guess what struck me is, you know, oftentimes you read about these self-made men, and, they, you know, they lost their father at age eight or something. Like, no, this is the opposite of that. It's also interesting that a man of Secretary Baker's remarkable talents political skills came from a family that essentially, I think, had the mantra of stay out of politics. Right. <laughs> Didn't I, that, that struck, struck, really struck me. Well, that's right. And I think to, to Susan's point, in some ways, therefore, getting into politics was kind of a rebellion because you had such a, a legacy to live up to if you were named James A. Baker III in Houston. By the way, he should be James A. Baker IV. For some reason, they can't count correctly. There are four James <laughs> A. Bakers up to him. But that legacy, that name carries such a burden. So I think you're right. I think by the time he becomes 40, he's like, I'm restless. I'd like to do my own thing. Politics, and, and, and he has his good friend, George H.W. Bush from the tennis courts of the Houston Country Club says, come work with me. And I think that, in the happenstance of history, it's interesting, right? History changes yeah. because of that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you lived through that era, you knew the closeness of uh, Secretary Baker, uh, Jim Baker at the time, uh, um, and, and George Herbert Walker Bush. But what struck me, and I, I would just wonder if you would agree with this uh, comparison, but um, when you learn at, uh, I guess in his 20s, 30s, that he's this champion tennis player at his father's country club, his country club, and how competitive he was in the game, I automatically think, yep, well, that, that's be, you know, that transferred over. That's exactly how Jim Baker was in politics as well. He loved to win, right? That's right. And I'm glad you isolated that out because I think that also explains an awful lot of him in public life. And by the way, also his bond with Bush, also fanatically competitive. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, that was something, that was his approach to deal making. It was his approach to politics. Uh, and it's why he ran five different uh, presidential campaigns. And he was extremely strategic in, in both those campaigns and in his approach to those big policy jobs. And I think he also got that from the tennis courts. And by the way, his father, uh, again, that legacy there, his dad was also a tennis player, also a champion uh, at the country club. And he was so strict that when Baker was young, he would play a tennis match, and then his father would insist to get back on the court to practice. Uh, you know, George Bush shows up in Houston, uh, and they had that in common, too. George Bush's father 
was overbearing and was Prescott Bush was a senator from Connecticut. Bush uh, had left and gone to Texas to make his own way, but clearly operated in the shadow. Prescott Bush was so intimidating of a figure, he insisted his children call him senator uh, at, at the dinner table, uh, right? Imagine that. And so I think that they bonded over uh, this shared sense of family obligation and chafing at it. Uh, but yeah, Bush was competitive. He looked on the wall at the Houston Country Club and there's a list of all the winners of the uh, you know titles on the wall there. And he would have noticed that Jim Baker had been the singles champion for the couple of years before the Bushes turned up in Houston. And uh, so they became doubles partners and actually they did win the club championship. I believe it was twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were both quite proud of that till the end of their day. Yeah, well, I, I just have to give you an interesting parallel. I, I was a chief of staff for members of Congress, for cabinet members, you know, so I know, um, you know, I'm this big compared to that big for Secretary Baker as a chief of staff. But uh, having worked for Elizabeth Dole for years in several roles, uh, I immediately grabbed hold of the word you gave to Baker, which was perfectionist. Because that's what uh, that's how I always viewed Elizabeth Dole. Now she was not a tennis player, but it's interesting. My whole time working with her, people would say, "What's it like to work for Elizabeth Dole?" And I immediately said, "Well, if you have ever played tennis, and th and think about when you played your absolute toughest opponent, and getting up every morning uh, and having to be on the other side of the court with them. That's how it was to work for Elizabeth Dole. I mean, very intense and very perfectionist. I think you're right, but you play better tennis, I guess, a better tennis player. And the same thing, I think, when you work for somebody who's great uh, perfectionist tennis. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have a chapter. Uh, it's called uh, God Came Today. And I, I, you know, I know it obviously came, those were the words from... Jim Baker, when he lost his first wife, what a tragic thing. And I, but here's another fascinating thing that the two of you dug up and I had never heard before. And that is um, um, when Secretary Baker learned that his uh, first wife's illness was terminal, uh, what, what a remarkable thing that he, he only told George Herbert Walker Bush didn't even tell his wife. Of course, I'm sh obviously he was doing that to protect her, uh, but but just it says something stunning, doesn't it, about the relationship he had with Bush? I think that's exactly right. Yes, it was a different era. I can't imagine today a husband holding back from his wife something like that. He knew she was sick, obviously, but he thought it would be better if she had her last months. Uh, as free of concern as possible. But you're right. It, 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 the one person he confides in, George H.W. Bush, he writes him a letter and he says, I haven't told my wife, I haven't told my mother, I haven't told the kids. I'm telling you. And that will forge a bond like almost nothing else, right? That's a personal bond. A lot of secretaries of state and presidents in this history of the country, but not one of them, I think, ever had a bond like that over something so personal. And in fact, when Mary Stewart died, the last people outside of the family to see her were George and Barbara Bush. Although an interesting postscript, which was that Barbara Bush, actually, when we were able to speak with her for this book, she did say that she thought that Jimmy knew that that was a mistake. Uh, yeah. She said it was a barbaric treatment at that time for cancer and also that, you know, it was it was a mistake. Yeah. 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 Um, way, uh, she did know, of course. Yes. Of course yeah. she knew. Yeah. 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 Yes. She wrote her own letter to him and yeah, she yeah. left it behind that's right. In, in, in fact, I'm sorry, Peter, I, that, I was wanted to touch to go to that next because I don't, I don't imagine that that letter was in his papers uh, somewhere. And you quote from it directly, which means he offered it up at some point. But as writers, it, that just seems like such a sensitive thing. Like when you heard of this letter, did you say, well, can we see it? Or uh, how did that occur. He was willing to share it with us. And in fact, when he read it, he gave it to us and read it. And he's crying at age 80, whatever oh. he was at that time. You know, here he was half century later, and it still moved him. This letter uh, for your viewers was left by his wife saying, of course, I know I'm dying. 
And you have been the love of my life, in effect. And I, and I, I, I want you to, to have a good life with the boys and take care of them and all this. And she left an addresser in the house. And it, after she passed, it was her friend, Susan Winston, who comes to the house and says to Jimmy, she says, you know, Mary Stewart left you a letter. Let me help you find it. They find the letter and show it to him. And you're right. It had never been published before. Uh, and I think it was just, you know, for us, you know, a very powerful moment and a very powerful part of his life story. And of course, the more even amazing and interesting footnote to that is that Susan Winston, the friend who, you know, not only found the letter, but really helped the family, uh, you know, a lot, helped him with these four boys, uh, later became his wife. Uh, and they had this remarkable sort of, uh, you know, this was the era of the Brady Bunch on TV when this happened. But she had three children uh, and had been divorced, uh, alcoholic husband. He had these four grieving young boys. They got married. It was a real life Brady Bunch, although actually kind of a Brady Bunch from hell. Uh, it didn't really work out so well initially. And uh, it was a real challenge to integrate these two very troubled families who had obviously had real uh, you know, challenges in the kids' lives. And uh, they eventually then had another child together, a daughter. So they have eight children. Uh, and mm -hmm. that was an enormous burden on Susan Baker because this was then the period that Jim Baker was beginning his public life. Uh, and again, uh, she was really left on her own. I think she said she had four children in middle school at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not easy to <laughs> having <laughs> one child in middle school recently. Yeah, I well, I I won't go into any great depth on this, but when I read the letter uh, in the book, um, I had to put it down and stop for an hour before picking it up again. I, I was in a similar situation, had terminal illness, and uh, wrote a, a letter. In, of that vein, uh, and fortunately, I was miraculously saved. But reading a letter like that, wow! It just really. Uh, it, thank you for including it in the book. It really was something else. So um, now you talk about um, his uh, second wife, Susan, um, and all the you know, the Brady Bunch uh, plus ten that they went through. Um, I thought it a little ironic um, in that. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush and Susan um, had the great idea, well, how can we help him get over this remorse? And, and one of the things they thought was, well, let's just have him sink into this second Senate race for Bush. That'll get his mind off of it. And I just kind of, later in the book, over and over, Susan's complaining about where is he? <laughs> I just wonder if she came back to regret that in some way. <laughs> I think it was a struggle, obviously, but she was always supportive. I mean, in the end, she lived with an awful lot, put up with an awful lot. And we got a chance to see them in their retirement years. And they obviously have a very uh, happy marriage. And I think it uh, worked out well. But it was strenuous, I think, for her in particular. Yeah. Um, I learned in my time in, in on Capitol Hill and in the administration, I, I, someone told me once, and I said, yep, you're right. And it's this phrase about how politics abhors a vacuum. And, and I, I was interested to see, because I'd never thought of it this way before, but you're absolutely right. Jim Baker's incredible ascension so quickly in, in the power circles of Washington was because there was an immense vacuum that you remind us of the fact that well, a ton of the political talent was wiped out in Watergate, right? Exactly. He is a product, uh, you know, not only of this uh, tragic accident of his wife's death at this early age, uh, and that that would be the exact moment, in effect, when he's ready to make this big change, you know, move to Washington. But also, uh, there's this enormous opportunity for him. And so he arrives and essentially in 1975 in Washington to the Ford administration in a uh, essentially obscure job in the Department of Commerce, not then or ever uh, the center of the action. Uh, and yet within one year, he is running the presidential campaign of the incumbent president of the United States, Jerry Ford, that no one has ever heard of a trajectory like that ever uh, in American politics of, you know, recent vintage. And uh, it was a testament, of course, to Baker's unique uh, abilities. He just thrived on these bigger and bigger playing fields. Uh, but also, you know, it was a young man 
Dick Cheney uh, at the White House uh, in the Ford uh, White House who plucked him out of this obscurity as well. So, you know, this this wouldn't have been possible even a few years earlier. Yeah, I think right around that time frame, um, he got he was extremely good at what he did. And I uh, remember you quote him saying uh, that he picked up really quick. Uh, I think the quote was, uh, everybody's an expert in politics. And uh, it, I, I had a mantra myself that I, you don't need a license to practice politics. That's for sure. And I, I so I could uh, thank you again for putting that in the book, because it really it helps a reader like myself identify with how Baker felt. Um, he was really good at his game, but, but everybody was playing the game, whether they had skill or not, right? In fact, there was this, the, the, the tension over uh, another Bush aide and uh, who was very domineering in the president, and then Baker didn't like it. I'm the campaign manager, but he can't confront his friend George about it. And he actually has his wife, Susan, do the, uh, do the deed for him. She calls up Bush and says, you're going to lose Jimmy if you don't take care of this. So, I mean, you know, everybody has a, a view of it. The president's brother, the future president's brother, Jonathan Bush, was constantly trying to do fundraising in a way that Baker didn't want him to. And he found that kind of stressful and having to deal with the candidate's brother. Candidate's families are almost always, you know this, candidate's families are almost always, you know, tricky uh, for any aide or campaign operative to figure out. Yeah, in fact, this is the moment when he really has to throw himself into 16-hour workdays, seven days a week to succeed. And uh, I, I will talk to you about this is later life in a moment, but I wonder, did you, did he, did you pick up that um, he had the typical kind of regrets that every major player like that often seems to have because they're at a moment in their life when they are never at home and oftentimes that can lead to trouble. And I, did he, did he have real regrets over that? No, Jim Baker is not, uh, you know, he is a man of the old school. He's not a super introspective uh, character. He uh, didn't have, you know, decades worth of diaries he offered up to us or anything. Uh, you know, he was quite frank about the troubles uh, um, that the families had had integrating and that his own boys had, including, uh, you know, one of his son's drug use right in the middle of Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. Uh, you know, a reminder um, you know, that that, public uh, morality and politicians who sling it are not necessarily, uh, you know, connected with how people actually live their lives. Uh, so he was very frank on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, he is a very, I would say, sort of confident figure and sort of like, here I am, warts and all, uh, but not given to introspection or even second guessing, whether it was his political second guessing. Uh, and that can come up, I'm sure, uh, you know, things like the 1988 Willie Horton ad, he said, well, maybe that was a regret, uh, but then sort of even backpedaled on that. So he, he was not a sort of, uh, these are all the things I, I screwed up in my life kind of a character for us. In fact, I think Susan Baker quoted, I think, saying she never bothered to try yeah. to get him to That's feel right. guilty because he just doesn't do regret. That's he not doesn't his do thing. Anything. <laughs> okay. I don't do regret, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um now, we'll move forward to 1980. Um, this is where I get really interested because it ties into Reagan. Um, uh, and, and Secretary Baker, um, uh, at the time, they fight the tough fight. Uh, they go through the primaries. But it becomes obvious to him that Bush is going to lose to Reagan. It's just not going to happen. Um, can you... And... and and he had to confront the candidate with it. And here's the candidate who's his best friend, right? Can you talk about that time and the, the aspect of Secretary Baker? I think this is probably where his skill shone forth in a way in his career that was just really at its heights. He had figured out, he was the guy that architected the, I'm going to make you vice president. Now talk to us about what he did and how that happened. Exactly. Every candidate should have a friend who's close enough to be honest with you, right? To tell you not just that you're great because everybody tells you that, but to tell you the truth and just say, hey, you're going to lose. And Baker, you're right, had the insight that he could, that Bush could lose the presidential race, the primary race, but still potentially get on the ticket. And that if he went too long and if he was too harsh on Reagan after it became clear he wasn't going to win, that he could simply alienate 
you know, the head of the ticket and lose that opportunity. So he had, in fact, be the one to say to Bush, it's time. It's, you're, you're done. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, he, he tells the Washington Post, you know, yeah, we're closing the California office. We don't have money to keep it open for the primary. Bush reads this in the paper and is furious. It's like a, his own friend is like undercutting him in the news. And Baker says, look, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. And they had a powwow in Houston where he kind of comes, you know, a come to Jesus moment where you have to sort of face reality. And it caused some, some sourness. I mean, Barbara Bush is a little peeved at, at, at that. But Baker was right. Baker got him onto the ticket. In fact, he wouldn't have got on the ticket if he'd gone much longer. As it was, the Reagan people were suspicious of him and weren't really necessarily thrilled about having him. Had he gone much longer, had he been much harsher, it could have turned out very differently. The other thing I find interesting about how remarkable it is that he succeeded in these key roles for so long was I had to try to imagine him navigating the situation where the Bushies thought that Secretary Baker essentially had betrayed them by maneuvering to the chief of staff role for, for President Reagan. And at the same time, the Reagan people uh, resented him for not being a Reaganite, being a Bushie. And yet he was able to navigate that to be as successful as he was. I would bet there's very few political figures that could pull something like that off. Well, I think it speaks a lot to Reagan and to Baker that Reagan would pick him as chief of staff, right? Because, you know, here Baker had run not one but two campaigns against him in 76 for Ford and 1980 for Bush. And yet Reagan saw something in Baker that he knew he needed, he wanted. It wasn't enough to have Ed Meese, the loyalist, be his chief of staff if, if, as everybody always said, every paper that headed into his briefcase never came out again. You know, that wasn't the right role for Ed Meese. But Baker was a guy who could make Washington work. He understood the gears of machinery there. And so, yeah, I think it says a lot that uh, that Baker would impress Reagan and that Reagan would put aside any bitterness from these two campaigns to have Baker as his number one person. Although I think it's important to be clear, this wasn't like Ronald Reagan's idea, right? You know, as <clears throat> with anything in uh, the Reagan presidency, right? Like this was uh, one faction, uh, uh, Stuart Spencer and uh, Mike Beaver coming up with the idea. They, they are kind of at odds with each other over uh, who who has first had this insight uh, in the way that successful ideas often have a thousand fathers. Uh, but, uh, you know, they teamed up and uh, even before, interestingly, the November uh, election, they were already working on this scheme, thinking that they were going to win it in the fall. They uh, organized it such that Baker would have some time with Reagan on the plane, that Reagan would get comfortable with him. So, you know, it's an idea that Reagan embraced, but it was brought to him by two other key members of the inner circle. Yeah, well, the two of you will be happy to know that those factions are still warring over this subject to this very day. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I have to listen to that to that debate, but um, it it was great that you wrote about it. Remark the incredible day, the, the near incredible tragedy of President Reagan, the assassination attempt on President Reagan, day seventy, in uh, in his presidency. Um, one of the best parts about this book, I really felt as someone who studies Reagan, is the moment you covered when Baker, Deaver, Meese have rushed over to the hospital, GW Hospital, and find themselves in a broom closet. And they're talking about whether to drive towards the 25th Amendment. Uh, and I, the insight you gave me was the hesitancy that's, that Baker had uh, because uh, he felt if they were to go for the 25th Amendment, it could be perceived as him trying to elevate uh, Bush towards the presidency. I know that wasn't all of his thinking, but it was a factor, and I, I had never thought of that. So I, I just, uh, and that's, can you comment on that? Because I, I wonder if you dug that out of Secretary Baker or if that was just evident. No, I mean, he was very straightforward about that. And, you know, one interesting thing is that he really was instinctively acting to protect his friend George Bush. Uh, and by the way, it actually squared also with George Bush's own instincts at that moment of peril, uh, even though they weren't coordinating or speaking with each other in real time about it. Uh, you know, Bush was out of town uh, in Texas uh, when this happened, uh, was flown back immediately to Washington. Uh, they said, well, sir, we'll, we'll fly you over to the, to the South Lawn of the White House. He said, absolutely not. 
that only the president lands there, you will take me home to uh, the Naval Observatory and then I'll take the motorcade uh, to the White House. And that was a stark contrast, of course, to Al Haig uh, marching into the press briefing room and they were saying, incorrectly, I'm in charge here. And so, you know, again, they're acting on pure instinct, but I think what's, what's striking is how much Baker intuitively and instinctively was uh, wanting to protect Bush's political uh, position and his own. He was still an interloper in this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Reaganista inner circle. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and this, it's interesting how history can repeat itself because here we are with uh, what you wrote about when the Reagan, uh, in that instance with Reagan, is that uh, Baker and others on the White House staff uh, did not do their level best to relay all of the health information of the president. There was things they hid from the public, just as we find ourselves in, the, in today with COVID and, and President Trump. The history really does repeat itself, doesn't it? It seems like that's the natural instinct of the White House staff. I think it is a long history of presidents hiding their health concerns. I think that in the Reagan case, they were not open about how touch and go it had been for him. Uh, and they wanted to project strength as any president would want to do. I don't know that they came out and were quite as, you know, uh, evasive or, or, or dissembling, you might say, as the current situation. I think we're, we're getting, you know, multiple stories out of the current White House that are in conflict with each other. And I think Baker was always careful. He may not have always told the full truth, but he always made clear he didn't want to lie to reporters because he knew credibility mattered. And that was something he really cared about. Yeah, I do think the difference between lying actively and, uh, you know, not telling the whole truth or at, at, at the same time, there is a distinction. And, you know, certainly as a journalist, I, I strongly prefer someone whose personal mantra is don't lie to reporters to someone whose personal mantra is that reporters are the enemies of the people, <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's the difference between a sin of commission and a sin of omission, right? The, yeah, a bit of a difference. I have to tell you, I felt, um, uh, I don't know that others would agree with me, but uh, I'll quote you from the book. I saw it as being the greatest ultimate compliment to give to Jim Baker about um, his time in Washington. And that is, you, you noted that, that Baker uh, was the one uh, who translated Reagan's grand design into reality. And I, I have to, I say that only because to this day, as I, study Reagan a lot. Um, you know, there's 10, there were 10 idea guys for every one uh, practical uh, implementer in the, in, especially in the early Reagan years. And, and you are absolutely right. Uh, Ronald Reagan, at least his first term, would not have been as successful as it was without, without Jim Baker at the helm there. I think mean, Baker is an engineer, not an architect, right? He, he didn't envision the design for the house but he made clear how it was you could uh, put up a foundation that was supported. And he got rid of the things that he thought were distractions and things that were going to pass, like Reagan had promised to get rid of the education department. Baker thought that's a loser. It'll never happen. We got a Democratic House, so let's not waste energy on it. He also didn't particularly find himself all that fond of social issues. That wasn't his area. He thought it was just uh, something that would distract from the bigger point. And he always kept his eye on the prize. And the first year in particular, the prize was the economic package, the tax cuts. And he thought everything else was a distraction. So he pushes off things like the AWACS sales or foreign policy. He basically tells Al Haig, keep off the front page. We need to keep focused on what's really important. And Reagan seemed to appreciate that. I mean, Reagan was more of a pragmatist than people often thought. Baker told us again and again, a thousand times if we heard it once, that Reagan told him, I'd rather get 80% of what I want than fly my flag going over the cliff. Uh, and I think that's also a difference between today. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think you um, have a quote in the book about uh, how President Reagan told uh, Jim Baker, you are a true Reaganite. <laughs> you, you get it, you know. After, when he left to go become, uh, you know, after leaving Secretary of Treasury to become George Bush's campaign manager in 1988, that's what he said at his farewell. And boy, I think nothing could have mat mattered more to Baker who had felt the slings and arrows for seven or eight years of not being sufficiently loyal to Reagan. Well, that's yeah. right. that was really a theme of his whole tenure was, you know, feeling undersalted first because he was a newcomer and insecure in that. But also there was always the undercurrent uh, and even the explicit uh, sort of war between factions in which Baker's perceived lack of ideological purity was used as a political club against him by his internal rivals in what was really a very backstanding uh, uh, White House. And, you know, even this, this, uh, 
sort of mantra, let Reagan be Reagan, uh, was an implicit uh, critique of Jim Baker. He, to this day, uh, you know, I think that was the uh, criticism that stung and lasted the most. And that may well explain, actually, some of his reluctance uh, to disavow a Republican Party that's moved very far away from him uh, in many ways ideologically, I think, is that at the core, uh, you know, he still is that White House chief of staff under assault uh, uh, in some ways. But when Nancy Reagan, of course, passed away, who did she ask to give the eulogy at her funeral? She asked Jim Baker. Yeah, that's right. Um, what a moment that was. Uh, now, the proof positive we have about the axiom that the job of chief of staff at the White House is the toughest job in the world um, is the fact that, as you write, even Jim Baker wanted out. I mean, he, he, I think you literally said, or he said, that he, it would, he was just burned out, right, after four years. Yeah, exactly. I think he was the, both the, the case study in how to be White House chief of staff and also case study how much it, it, it's a terrible job, right? That in fact, yeah. you do get everything, everything. And it's so overwhelming. And so he did spend several years even trying to figure out a way out. He was sort of plotting at one point to be NASA security advisor. At one point, he flirted with becoming baseball commissioner. You know, he talked to his friend George about becoming maybe a UN ambassador. And it was only this happenstance conversation he had with Don Regan at the end of the first term that really suddenly provided that escape route. Yeah, yeah. And, and Peter, you call it an escape route, and I'm sure that's what it was. I just I found it fascinating because in the book you make the point rightly so that you know when Secretary Baker understood that you know titles don't you know bring you power in Washington you know power brings you power and uh, uh, and um, but at the same time he changed course at the end of those four years as you've just said and I guess titles did become important for him at some point right uh, to take on the role of Secretary of Treasury. That's an important insight. Look, he was desperate to escape the label of political handler and strategist. He didn't want to be a staffer anymore in the background, whispering in the president's ear. He wanted to be a principal in his own right. Uh, it means you have your own seat at the table uh, and are no longer merely uh, uh, basking in the reflected power uh, and privilege of your boss. And Baker was ready for that, uh, no question about it. Uh, Treasury Secretary might not have even been the most natural fit. Uh, Attorney General wasn't available. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Secretary of State was something he would come to later. And, uh, you know, this is a guy with one single undergraduate course in economics, uh, you know, and he probably didn't even do very well at that. So, uh, you know, he, uh, he took what he could get there. But I do think you're right that in the end, he understood there are different... Uh, uh, kinds of careers. And for him, he didn't want his narrative to be that of always, you know, that the helper of someone else, even though he knew he was more powerful. I mean, that was the abrupt change in the relationship with George Bush. Bush was a constitutional officer. He was the vice president of the United States, next in line to the presidency. And yet Baker knew, and of course, Bush knew on a day to day basis, he was far more powerful uh, in the Reagan White House than his friend. Yeah. Just as we talked about Baker was responsible for so much of the success of the first Reagan term, it becomes almost a two plus two equals four when you think about the fact that he, when he went to Treasury, the White House lost uh, that discipline and Reagan had one heck of a tougher uh, second term. And I, you know, when you read the book, it's just so evident that a lot of that, the Iran Contra and all that mess, it could not have happened on Jim Baker's watch. It just doesn't, it seems to me it couldn't. Right. That's what Michael Deaver thought anyway. That's what Nancy Reagan thought anyway. Had Baker been there, she would have, he would have stopped it. He wouldn't have allowed it. In the very early days, he was always wary of the adventurism in Central America. And he, in fact, he sits Michael Deaver down in the first days in the White House, and they're sitting so close that Deaver remembers their knees almost touching. Because the one thing you and I have to do is we have to make sure we don't get caught up in some kind of new Vietnam down in, in Central America. That was always his thought. So Iran Contra, we think it's fair to say probably wouldn't have happened had he still been there. Yeah, yeah. But fast forward uh, now into the Bush years and a couple of years and a year into the Bush year. Um, it seems to me that of all the successes that Jim Baker was able to help President Bush achieve and achieved a lot of it himself was 
the reunification of East and West Germany. That uh, talk about that for a moment because that seems to be, you know, some of the most sensitive diplomacy of the of the twenty first century. No, I, I do agree with you. I think that was the pinnacle of Jim Baker's diplomacy and uh, really probably the most specific area you can point to and say, uh, you know, history wasn't inevitable. Uh, and uh, while in hindsight, it looks like worse this um, there were many, many very genuine obstacles to this deal getting done, especially in the time frame in which uh, history allotted for it. Uh, imagine 10 months later, Saddam Hussein invades Iraq, I uh, sorry, invades Kuwait, uh, and that could have, uh, you know, made it just impossible. Uh, the world of culture in the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's position was not strong. And in fact, the hardliners eventually did launch a coup against him. What if they had done so earlier? And then, of course, uh, actually the British and the French, Margaret Thatcher, violently opposed uh, to reunifying Germany after two devastating world wars. Uh, and back in Washington, there were hardliners as well uh, who were very suspicious that uh, Baker and Bush would, uh, you know, not negotiate a tough enough deal. And, and even in West Germany, by the way, uh, the Chancellor Helmut Kohl was literally not on speaking terms with the German foreign minister, Hans Dietrich Enter. Baker himself had to personally often act as the intermediary and the bridge between these two feuding West German leaders. So there are so many, so many obstacles to it. No playbook, by the way. Also, the fall of the Berlin Wall was a shock. Uh, and even in the State Department, uh, just a few months earlier, when they came into office, there was a memo to Baker uh, about this saying, sorry, you know, unification is a pipe dream. We all love the idea of it, but it's not going to be happening anytime soon. So they did not know what they were doing. They did not have a plan. And yet, uh, you know, by January, Baker has come up with this formulation, uh, working with his staff at the State Department, the two plus four. Uh, a way of bringing everyone into it, the two Germanys and the four victorious World War II powers. And, you know, essentially he's like, you know, like in a cartoon, the guy spinning the plates and, you know, throwing it all up in the air over one crazy weekend of negotiating uh, in Canada. Even the White House uh, and uh, Brent Scowcroft, the National Security Advisor and Bush himself, were not really sold on this. And yet Baker managed to sell it to all the allies uh, in in a feat that uh, really, I think once that was done, uh, it, it was a question of details. And just this last weekend here uh, has been the celebration of the 30th anniversary of this deal. Yeah, and uh, really something, an important moment in history. I just want to talk briefly about the process of writing the book. Um, did It must have helped that Jim Baker seems to have been one of history's greatest pack rats. <laughs> the the number the number of documents, back of the envelopes, notes that that, that were available to you, I, did that make the the book easier to write? It certainly was just so much good material there that he seemed to have been so organized and to save. Absolutely, no question about it. The archives in Princeton provide a roadmap of his life. Now, there are not a lot of secret memos in which he sort of unburdens himself, right? They're not mm -hmm. diaries in which he sits there and says, this is what I'm really feeling. And I'm mad at George today, or I'm, I'm you know, I, I think that the whole thing is going to fall apart if we don't do this. There's not a lot of that kind of documentary uh, evidence, but you see, as Susan mentioned, the memos from the father, which are very sort of revealing in their own way. You see little notes that he's jotted to himself or to other people, including copies of. There's a point at which... Mikhail Gorbachev actually apparently uh, sends him, uh, uh, says to a, a, another American official that he thinks that Baker leaked something. And there's a note that Baker has written to Mikhail Gorbachev denying that he's a leaker, which is kind of funny. <laughs> <often considered, laughs> we all know he's a famous leaker, but he might not have leaked that particular thing. And he saves all this. There's even a file folder there when he was Treasury Secretary in his Treasury Department files of all the letters that people had sent him saying, hey, you're so good, you should run for president. Why do you save that? These are just random people. They don't really mean anything. You save it because you, you might want to run for president someday. I think just finding that folder, I thought, was telling in its own way. So, yeah, I agree with you. The documentary evidence is almost as interesting, if not more, than the interviews with, with him and his family and everybody else. You know, his, you spent, uh, I think, 70 hours interviewing him and spoke to almost 200 others. Uh, this is a little bit of an unfair question, but if I said to you, can you just, just give me one word 
that you think defines Jim Baker? Is that possible? One word, me. <laughs> Am I off one? I would say discipline, maybe. That would be one. Discipline. Discipline. Maybe. Calculating. Calculating. Uh, mm. uh, self possession or self confidence, maybe? Yeah, very self confident. Mm. I would put self confident. Self confident, right? I mean, he was self confident no above uh, discipline. I think they go hand in hand. I think that he had a, a capacity for taking on a challenge without seeming to, to shrink away from it the way many of us might. You know, many of us might look at taking on treasury without having an economics degree and be a little daunted. <laughs> it doesn't seem to have ever bothered him. There's no evidence if it did. Yeah. Right? Supremely confident. Supremely That's right. confident, yeah. Yeah. Your, the, your story about the East-West Germany is evidence of that as well. Um, he just sort yeah. of dies on in. And I think uh, that's, that was part of the key to his success. Yeah, yeah. I think you you term him in the book, or others have, or maybe he even, you know, not himself said this, but um, cold blooded. You know, it's the, that kind of personality, cold blooded personality. His closest advisor, Margaret Tutwiler, she was the one who said, you know, there's just no one. Uh, he's an absolutely unsentimental man when it comes to looking and evaluating a situation. She didn't mean you know, not loving. I mean, he had a, you know, very close relationship with his core staff uh, over, you know, the entire 12 years of his tenure, including Margaret Tutwiler. Uh, but she meant in terms of his dispassionate, uh, uh, ruthless, almost, you know, willingness to want to understand a problem as it is, not as he would want it to be. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know it's at what age he reached to 80, 85, what have you, but uh, the Jim Baker that I've seen had the fortune to see up close in his later years, uh, as you say, you know, the Mrs. Reagan's funeral. Um, I also recall um, the speech he gave here at the Reagan Library uh, during the, the Reagan centennial, Mrs. Reagan chosen for that. And in those moments, um, he choked up a fair amount. And uh, I missed that engaging smile that infected Americans with his generous nature and the optimistic belief that each of us can make the best of ourselves if we only dare to dream of a better future. Uh, I think just like maybe you saw when you interviewed him, there, there are tears that comes to his eye as he looks back now. So there's some sentimentality there for sure. Absolutely, you're right. That's the, the interesting thing. Just the, the rigorousness of his mind, I think, is what Margaret was speaking to uh, as much as uh, you know, he, he is obviously uh, an emotional person. Uh, it, it, you know, I, for me, I, I think of uh, him uh, at the bedside of his, his best friend, George H.W. Bush, when Bush died, and he was literally rubbing Bush's feet as he passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that was recounted, Peter and I attended the, the funeral at the Washington Cathedral for President Bush and looking down, uh, you know, we were seated up above in the balcony, looking down at Baker, uh, weeping as this was recounted uh, from the lectern of the Washington National Cathedral uh, was really, uh, was really something. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a few more questions. I'll let, let the two of you go. Um, how has uh, Secretary Baker reacted to the book? He's been very uh, generous in, in, in uh, just paying in a couple of events with us. He did one at the Baker Institute, one at the Wilson Center. Uh, I don't think it's the book he would have written, and he understands that. There are things in there he obviously, I would imagine, doesn't agree with because it's not his interpretation but others. But he's been very supportive in understanding that the overall product, I think, uh, uh, he was fed with fair and, and, and acting kind of in the, I'll go all the way back to the prologue. In the prologue, um, you uh, you talk about the times and you say it was a far more optimistic Washington than today's angry and anxious capital. Um, I've got lots of colleagues that stay right on in jobs in Washington, D.C., who have defined the city as been being one heck of a lot less fun than it used to be. And I, I wonder from your perspective as reporters who've covered so much, um, you must really agree with that statement. Look, it's not, I mean, it's just, it's not even about, it's just, it's a very uh, bitter, rancorous, divisive politics that is reflected in 
uh, a city that no longer speaks, uh, you know, to the other parts of itself. Uh, and as you know, Congress is, you know, structurally changed such that members of Congress hardly know each other across the aisle. They spend so much less time here. They don't live here. They don't have homes here. Uh, and of course, they have a lot of structural incentives to make the kind of deals uh, and uh, that would flow from such relationships. Uh, you know, the politics now is uh, about mobilizing the ever angrier base and not persuading the vast majority. You know, you're not aiming for 51% anymore uh, uh, in many of these interactions. And the sort of permanent campaign we've seen uh, you know, is the antithesis of the approach that Baker took. Very, very partisan in the election years he was, but uh, very determined to do something with that power and, and saw governing in a different bucket than he saw campaigning. And now, of course, the two have fused in a way uh, that is much to our detriment, it seems to me. You don't have to be nostalgic, you know, and glorify the past to understand uh, that we have lost some things. And of course, we then have a very explosive uh, figure in, in the White House who uh, has made war on some of the basic institutions of American democracy in a way that uh, I think negatively affects anyone who has to stare directly at it day in and day out. Most mm -hmm. Americans don't, uh, but it's tough for those of us who do. Yeah, I, I wonder as reporters who have covered so much of this up close, if, uh, but like Ronald Reagan, you know, is there a sense of optimism on, on your part that things won't return to whatever normal was, but that it'll get better? I'm a congenital optimist. I do think the history moves in waves and that there are moments of particular divisiveness and polarization and that they and that they fade over time. But this is not the most polarized time we've had in our history, obviously. It was, we're a country that had a civil war uh, for four bloody years, but it is a particularly di divisive moment. It is, it, is, uh, it is wearing, I think, on the players in town, including the journalists. And so I, I look forward to a time when maybe it won't be quite so uh, bitter and rancorous to use her words. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever see, uh, aside from future presidents, um, people that are able to um, gain positions of power such that they will be as influential in the future as Baker was in, in his day? Or is... is are those positions in Washington no longer available? <laughs> you know, it, it's a great question. Uh, you know, Tom Donilon, Barack Obama's uh, uh, national security advisor told us he considered Baker to be the most important unelected official in the United States since uh, World War II. And that portfolio of having both the politics, five presidential campaigns, and also uh, the policy with Treasury Secretary and Secretary of State that's just hard to imagine anyone, you know, merging, fusing Karl Rove and Henry Kissinger. No, you know, it's just, it's, that's very unlikely uh, to happen. Uh, remember that even that unique relationship between Bush and Baker, uh, between a president and a secretary of state, arguably that was without precedent in American history. Even Jefferson and Madison might be the only precedent there. And Madison really was a young accolade of, of Jefferson's not a peer. Uh, and so, you know, it might be sui generis, uh, no question. Uh, but, you know, America is filled with great people of talent. And one of the stories, one of the takeaways from Jim Baker's story is, uh, think of it, you know, there might be an obscure corporate lawyer out there somewhere, uh, you know, who, uh, given various accidents of history, uh, finds himself thriving on progressively bigger and bigger playing fields. Let's check the Commerce Department. Let's we'll yeah. see who's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, terrific. Well, listen, I, you've been so generous with your time, both of you, but Peter and Susan, and I can't thank you enough for that. And also can't thank you enough for writing such a, a terrific book, one of the best I've ever read. So thank great you. to be with you. Uh, and, this is yeah. a great conversation. We're so thrilled wonderful. to be doing it. You're wonderful to do it with us. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it.
That would be a very American thing to do.